everybody. Welcome back to Gone Outdoor Radio. You are listening on KELO and KWSN in Sioux Falls and the mighty 790 KFGO in the Fargo-Moorhead area. Scotty Brewer, Kyle Agri, Brewer Agri Outdoors. And we are going to chat with Mr. Scott Gankel. He is North Dakota Game and Fish Fisheries Management Section Leader. You know, Scott, I'm not sure what all of that means, but I know that you're pretty darn smart because when I read a bunch of the articles and things that you've written there and that you're involved in, you're involved in a lot of different stuff. Pretty much everything there is to be involved in, in fisheries in North Dakota. What do you think? Well, yeah, my job, you know, entails uh, supervising all the biologists statewide. And uh, to be honest, they don't require a lot of supervising, but I, I basically oversee the, the fisheries management activities of our biologists and in, in, in all the district offices across the state. So, yeah, I have to be kind of up to speed on a lot of different things, and I get to work on a lot of different things, which is kind of fun. I bet it is. So the reason we wanted to get you on is we wanted to talk about some of North Dakota's lake management planning, more specifically the balance between bait fish and predators, because it's something a lot of anglers don't necessarily really think about how important that is to the lake and how important that is to the anglers. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about that with, you know, North Dakota has had the advantage to kind of build lakes, you know, over the years as, as lakes have kind of popped up in the wet cycles and you've been able to stock what you want and, and kind of build a dream lake, whether it's walleyes or perch or whatever it is. How do you mm-hmm. how do you guys figure out that balance between bait fish and predator fish? Well, uh, a lot of the lakes that you're referring, referring to are our new prairie lakes, the ones that just kind of swelled up with water over the last few years. Uh, initially, when we'd go into one of those lakes, we'd put in yellow perch, and they'd do really well. But we found that a lot of these lakes have naturally occurring fathead minnow populations. And the fathead minnows are are really prolific in some cases to the point where they either suppress or outcompete the yellow perch that we were stocking there. And so if if you go back 20 to 30 years, in the mid-90s when we first started seeing some of these lakes swelling up, we had tremendous perch fishing. So we tried to keep replicating that, and we were failing in some cases, and we were wondering, what can we do with all this water out there? So some of our guys started stocking walleye in some of these lakes that had fathead minnows, and we were seeing tremendous growth. And so we've kind of gotten it to the point where that's our go-to fish now. If we have a, a lake with a lot of fathead minnows, uh, we'll go in with, with walleye fingerlings and introduce them. And the, the more simple you can keep the fish community, the better. So it's kind of a it's it's a simple recipe, but but it's based on, you know, fatted minnows and their abundance. Now, if the fatted minnows are low, um, we may still go with yellow perch, but if they're, if they're high in abundance, especially when we start a new lake, we'll go on with walleye. What we've seen is really good growth on some of those fish, too. I mean, we were getting 17-inch walleye at the end of their second year, and that's phenomenal, you know, anywhere you go. So it's been a really good recipe. Scott, I think you answered my question, and that was um... – as, as I was listening to your explanation, I thought you're, you're moving towards using more fathead minnows. Does that mean fewer opportunities for yellow perch for anglers in North Dakota? But it sounds like there still is a place for the yellow perch as well and, and giving anglers that opportunity also. Yeah, and, and we'll always have a lot of yellow perch lakes. Um, but yellow perch, really, their booms occur after a, a flooding cycle occurs. So if we go into a drought and we see some of these lakes dry up, and then you see them flood back again if we get a wet spell. The perch, you know, they lay their eggs on, on flooded vegetation and do really well there. And then if you have a, a food community of, of invertebrates, you know, small insects, bugs, things like that, and the water for the perch to eat, they, they can do really well. Again, it's the fathead minnows. If you have a lot of fathead minnows in there, perch will eat fathead minnows as well. But when you're trying to start a new population of small perch, uh, the fathead minnows will probably all compete them for all the insects and food if there's too many of them. And so that's where we get into a situation where we'll have a walleye introduction. And a lot of those lakes will continue to see yellow perch populations far on down the road, but they just, um, they're not going to be those big booming populations that you have when a lake is brand new and it's just barren. There's nothing in there but perch. Hey Scott. Um, so 
we've been talking about a new lake, a lake that you've had the ability to basically grow from nothing. So Mm -hmm. what about well-established lakes? Do you even try and manage the bait fish in that lake or does it just happen naturally? Well, there's not a lot you can do to manage bait fish just because the, the sheer number of fish, the bait fish, you know, small fish in a lake, we, we could never stock enough to add bait fish to it. And if they're already there, we're going to rely on natural reproduction there. So what we'll typically do is if we see, you know, we, through our population monitoring, through our, you know, netting in the summertime, we monitor sport fish conditions. You know, we look at their growth rates, how fast are they growing. And if they start to slow down or if they're starting to get a little skinny, we might back off on the stocking rates, you know. So that's where we kind of, we can kind of fine tune things just by stocking fewer predators, trying to take a year off, give them a little bit of a break, you know, here and there, and then let that forage base catch up. That might take a a year, it might take a few years or whatever, but nature kind of tends to, to even itself out there. So does North Dakota Game and Fish ever use uh, things like limits or slot limits or anything like that to help with the local bait fish populations? You know, our our philosophy in North Dakota is to keep things as simple as we can. As long as we have good fishing, we're going to try to minimize the amount of regulations we place on any of our waters just to kind of keep things as simple for anglers to enjoy the fishing out there. If we start to see a situation where maybe we do need to implement a regulation, um, we would consider that. But in most cases, uh, we haven't seen any need for regulation. So, no, we haven't really used regulations in that respect to monitor, to, to help manage the forage base out there. We use mostly our, our other management tools like stocking and, and that sort of thing, just fine-tuning those things. So, Scott, uh, we've been talking about fathead minnows being so prevalent in North Dakota, but there's other things that, walleyes specifically really tend to feed on depending on the system they're in you know schmelt is another one that comes to mind in missouri river system um and perch you know the perch can be a predator for a minnow for a fathead but it can also be food for a walleye so um it's got to be so complicated trying to figure out all of this between the balance between regular predators and the food that they're eating it really is. And, and like I mentioned earlier, the, the simpler you can keep a fish community when you're trying to manage it, it's a lot easier to manage. Once you start adding fish or if there's a lot of fish in a, in a community, like, like on the Missouri River system, it, it gets a lot more complicated. And, and you can't just manage just for, you know, this one specific type of forage. It's, it's everything together. And if, if rainbow smelt are, are down like they are, say, on Oahe, we might be looking at other types of forages, things like, uh, white uh, white crappies or, or white bass or, or anything that's small enough for, for a walleye to eat could be a potential forage. It's just that some some of those forages have more calories than others. Like a smelt is, is packed with calories compared to a, a white crappie. So uh, the more smelt we can have in the system, the better it is for, for fish growth in general. Yeah, for sure. Scott, we really appreciate you coming on Gone Outdoors. This is Scott Gangle, North Dakota Game and Fish Fisheries Management Section Leader, and we appreciate you helping us do a little deep dive into bait fish and predators and how it all goes together. Um, If people want to find out more information, I'm sure they can go to the Game and Fish website and read some of your articles that you've written. Yeah, and anybody with specific questions, you know, we we have um, all of our contact information is on the website and stuff and, and any of our biologists are always willing to answer questions on fishing and, and, and some of the fisheries that they manage so feel free to give them a call if you have a specific question about a specific lake or anything like that thank you scott for coming on gone outdoors you're welcome thanks for having me all right stick around we'll be back with the second half of gone outdoors after the short break